Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us for uh, this month's um, CVPS uh, presentation. Our, our uh, presentation will be uh, by Betsy Banks, but a more, more of that in a minute. But first, a few, uh, a few announcements. Uh, our, our upcoming photo walk is May 22nd to June 7th. Again, this will be an extended photo walk. Uh, and the, um, I believe the location will be the Beaver Marsh. So the um, critique for the photo walk will be on June the 9th and it will be a virtual critique. Our next meeting will be next month on June 16th. We'll feature Eileen Rafferty who will be exploring abstract photography. You all may remember Eileen. She was uh, a workshop presenter a few years ago uh, here in, in the Valley uh, on black and white photography. And looking forward a little bit, in July, our meeting will be on the 21st and that will be a member show. So get your pictures ready to share with your, uh, your friends and uh, fellow photographers and, and um, have some uh, critique offered up on, um, on your, your images. Now proceeding with tonight's program, I'm gonna turn the, turn the program over to um, Jim Retzel who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Jim. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this beautiful night in Northeast Ohio. How to, finally getting lucky here with some weather. Um, I generally do not read notes on things because I find them to be stuffy, but I have to do this with Betsy because uh, I have too much history with her and uh, I'm so fond of her, I don't want to screw any of this up. So <laughs> with that apology, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit to you and I'm, I, I uh, hope you're okay with that. Uh, if you don't know, Betsy's from Chagrin, Ohio. She went to Bowdoin College, which is in Maine. Go polar bears. If you've never heard of it, that's not really a bad thing. Uh, her summers, she worked at Maine. She worked at L.L. Bean as a picker, you know, and in the warehouse, putting together orders and stuff like that. So she's got, the, she's got a lot of Maine in her in, in, in very impressionable years. And I think that's a I think that's an important part to who she is. She's one of the coolest people I know. She's a published poet and photographer. Currently the director of the Center for Civic Engagement and Learning, which is called CECL at Case Western Reserve. And what that does is connect students with the neighborhood in which Case exists. And I think what it really attempts to do, and I think she's the perfect person for this, is to have people who might not ever be in Cleveland ever again, but it makes them kind of touch base with the real people that live there and, and the realities of their lives. And uh, she does that so well, and it's a difficult job. Before working at Case, Betsy taught environmental education in Michigan, Nevada, the Everglades, Yellowstone, and worked uh, in, con in conservation land management for, with the Nature Conservancy in Maine, California, Kentucky. She did all kinds of cool studies in the uh, Carismo and um, uh, Leach's Storm Petrol, where she used to share stories about uh, picking uh, babies out of nests that, and that leeches storm pencils ne nest real deep in rocks and reaching in and grabbing babies and counting things and stuff like that. Anyway, so there's a lot of nature in her life. There's a lot of Maine in her life. I've been fortunate that I miss, I visited Maine with her a, a few times. And um, if I was to use one word, it's just fun. Uh, even the, the stupid parts of I-90 can be very fun with her. Um, uh, she's just this wonderful docent for the, for that state sharing its best parts, like how to eat lobster, which is actually more of a, of a thing than you might realize um, if you've never eaten it before. And eat it with a Mainer is even cooler. Uh, the best places to eat breakfast in Bar Harbor, uh, where there are even stores on silly little lakes. Um, I, I so enjoy her work. And I especially, I especially enjoy the parts of her work that are also just fun, the, the blurs and the triptychs and the pans and some of the stuff that's less traditional because I am such a traditional photographer. She is one, uh, she is, is one of Maine's best adopted humans, and I am proud and fortunate to call her my friend. And with that said, ladies and gentlemen, here's Bets. Hey, well, thank you so much, Jim. It was like so kind of you. And 
Um, I really wish I could see everybody who's here. Like I said, if we were in person, that would be really nice to get together after uh, being apart for so long. So I am so pleased though, to be able to share via Zoom um, and maybe even more people can attend because we are on Zoom. Maybe it makes it a little bit easier, but um, I did want to, um, yeah, it's right sound. Oh, so on so, the that's right. It's up here. Can everybody mute that? I don't know if Anne's able to mute everybody. Oh, it's supposed to awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to take a minute, though, um, just to say that I am where I am as a photographer because of CVPS. And the great teaching of Jim has really propelled me forward so much. And all of you who I've had the good fortune of traveling with, of standing in morning meadows with, Maine with, here's a shot of folks shooting on our road trip that we did with CVPS. So again, I, I really have just like a heart of gratitude for everything that CVPS has opened up to me. Um, and it's such a pleasure to be invited to talk about Acadia. I know a lot of people in the room have been there. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversation afterwards if people would like to share their insights and places that they recommend um, going. So even though there are familiar people, I'm just gonna start at the Google Earth view that we are talking about Maine. So basically halfway down east, as they say, on the coast of Maine. Maine being the only state, here's a little factoid, the only state that's one syllable. And I believe it's also the only state that has only one border with another state. So um, Acadia, like I said, is um, located about halfway up the coast. You can see it here. And uh, the closest, if you're thinking about traveling there and you haven't, hours drive time to Bar Harbor, which is sort of the central busy town. Um, is listed there. So Google says it's about 14 from Cleveland. If for whatever reason, I think it takes me about 16 to get there. But you can also fly into a number of airports and drive from there, as you see there. So lots of ways to go. And if you fly in further south and drive, you can enjoy all the places along the main coast um, to shoot as well. So it's definitely a good way to go. And here's um, the main no pun intended, the main map of Acadia National Park's Mount Desert Island. And so um, I'm going to be talking mostly about the island. But I did want to make sure that everybody is aware that the park is more than just Mount Desert. There is Skudik Peninsula, as you can see, as well as Isle of Ho. But I'm not going to be talking about those two locations tonight based on time. So um, we'll just be focusing on the island. And just so you know, Acadia is one of our smallest national parks. So what's in a name? So is it Mount Desert or Mount Desert? Um, you can call it MDI for short, which makes it easy. But it was named in 1604 by a French explorer. So a lot of people think that it is dessert because it's a little bit more closely linked with the French pronunciation as well as um, when they saw the island, they saw the bald, they call them the bald uh, granite. So they thought it was deserted and, um, and um, barren looking. So you, you will hear it Mount Desert, but you mostly hear it um, Mount Desert. So I'm just gonna give a little brief history of uh, Mount Desert. I think it's an interesting one that we've really benefited from the generosity of folks. So it um, boomed with cottagers in the turn of the century and um, the island really became a retreat for really prominent people. So you can see the list of names there, all the big deep pockets of the US had um, these elaborate, huge, what they called cottages, but homes there. Most of them have burned, like a lot of big old places, but there was a huge fire, I think it was 1943, that swept across um, Mount Desert, a big chunk of it, which probably added to the beauty of the habitat, but
land. They loved Acadia, which was not desert at the time. And um, they really launched a campaign to get individuals to donate land to make this accessible to all. So it was a national monument for, first called Sortemont. It became the first national park in the East under the name Lafayette and then was changed to Acadia National Park. So every time I visit, I really thank the people who gave of their property because this could have easily been something like Nantucket or something like that that was a walled off island that's very difficult to access and people donated um, their land so that um, we could have it be a, a national park. So a few um, super fun fast facts about um, MDI. It's the largest main island and it has 40 miles of ocean shoreline in, on this island. So that's not even lakeshore. So 40 miles of coastline. There are 26 mountains um, and seven of them are over a thousand feet, including it has the highest peak on the Eastern seaboard north of Rio de Janeiro. So there's uh, some just facts to be thinking of. And of course, it's a national park with tons of visitors. They got almost 3 million a year. Um, people are predicting that national park visitation will continue to increase post pandemic. Um, so it that ranks it in the top 10 most visited national parks. It kind of bounces between six and eight at the different times I've seen it in terms of the most visitation. And, um, but it is not the biggest tourist attraction in Maine because more than 3 million people visit what retail store? L.L. Bean. So L.L. Bean is open 365 days a year. They remove the locks from the door because they're always open. So more visitors um, end up going to um, Beans than Acadia. So just a little history, Jim gave a little outline. Um, I went to college, a small liberal arts school called Bowdoin College. It's in Midcoast, Maine and visited. I had been in Maine once before, but visited when I was doing the college, you know, traveling and went up in that tower that you see there on the campus up to the top where they had a classroom to visit a class. And you could see the ocean way out from up there. And they were talking about how there had been a moose walking across campus. And I said, this is where I want to go. I want to be able to bike to the ocean to do my homework. I love the idea of moose on campus. Um, and so I just applied early decision and never looked back, which those of you who know me uh, to make a fast decision is not what I usually do. So I guess it was just meant to be. So this is the first trip, the slide back in the days of Kodachrome 64, you can see the coastline there. So um, I was really active in the outing club. And this was the first trip in the mid 80s that I went to um, Acadia. And there's in the bottom corner, um, we hiked the precipice trail, which is typically closed all through um, peregrine falcon breeding season now, but a really um, dramatic uh, trail. And again, this is up at the top of Cadillac before there were the paved trails that they have now um, with a group from. Um, college. So this really sparked for me just a lifelong love affair of Maine that continues to this day. Um, like Jim mentioned, you know, these were formative years. There's a book called like Coming of Age in Maine. And I felt like I really did come of age in Maine. So it always has it's such a big part of my heart in terms of um, magical places. So I also love birch trees and birch forests. So anyone who loves the Northwoods would love Acadia for the um, birches as well. So um, just to get you a little bit oriented to some of the photos that I'm gonna be showing tonight. So here's the map again, and then Bar Harbor is the main town, the village of Bar Harbor. And then um, this blue circles around the most popular part. A lot of people who visit Mount Desert only do this loop. It's called the Loop Road. It's one direction. So once you get on it, you gotta stay on it unless you jump off a couple of the off-roads places you can get off. Um, it is the most um, popular. That's where Cadillac Mountain is located. It's where the kind of classic granite that when you see Acadia shots that say Acadia, that are taken on this part of um, the island. And this red circle is known as the quiet side because people don't go over here quite as much. The uh, geology isn't nearly as dramatic. And as you can see, the green is parkland. The, Beige color is 
private holding. So there's still quite a lot of people on the island. This population is around 11,000 and, um, you know, people working, fishing, there's a high school, there's, you know, people going about their everyday life. So that's one of the things that's so special about Acadia is you can be in a national park, but then you also can just go through little towns. Um, and that arrow shows um, one of the most popular lighthouses um, on the island, um, Bass Harbor Head Light. So I thought I'd just do chunks of the island and just share some photographs so you get a sense of what might be there if you're new to the area. And if you've been to the park before, hopefully it'll be like fun memories of things that you've seen and places that you've been. So um, I put a yellow star that's near the areas that I'm gonna be sharing about. So first I wanted to talk about Boulder Beach and Ocean Path, which um, follows along the most um, visited spots. So this is a scene that, you know, when you get up early to go out and shoot that you would um, see this type of, you know, sunrise and the outlines of islands, the outlines of um, pine trees. It is the pine tree state. So um, just beautiful. And often you'll see, you know, boats, people fishing, of course. And this again is the um, coast when you first come on to the um, portion of the park that's on the loop road. And this is a place that we um, photographed during the time that we went on a road trip. So probably I think Jerry's somewhere in this, in this photograph. So this is looking down the coastline all the way to Otter Cliffs, which are the steep cliffs um, down at the end. We'll, we'll have a little bit closer view. So this is looking backwards, just so you can see like a little bit of what the geology looks like all along this part of the loop road. So the road goes really close to the coastline. You can pull off on one lane. There are parking lots, um, but you can also just park in one of the lanes. That's part of why it's one way. And then just walk out. Um, so you can see, if you look closely, there's a bunch of little people down in there. And so these pink, buffy, granite um, rocks and cliffs just all feed down into the water. So this is Boulder Beach. This is um, you know, kind of a classic main place to photograph, to shoot wide and to get low. So I'm super close, obviously, to these boulders. And they are called boulders because the surf on Acadia rounds these out by washing them ashore and then they run back, wash them ashore, run them back. So um, this is looking at Otter Cliffs right here. This is in college. I actually have done this rock climb here, but now I can't even like look over the edge. <laughs> I don't think about rock climbing over here, but this is Otter Cliffs. Um, it is hard to get down here now because it is so popular. So if you're there during like fall foliage, there are lines of people, people from the road trip know, like you heard people fighting for position. I mean, it, it is packed with people down here at, at Boulder Beach, but because it is so iconic. So this is before um, sunrise. This is after sunrise where the sun is just crested. So you can really see how changeable the color is in Acadia. It's one of the things I really love. It makes it hard to process your photographs, but like the granite can go everything from like a rosy pink to what the is doing and what the light is doing. So it's really fun to watch it. So here, beach of course, up higher. It's a little treacherous walking. You need to be careful because these do shift um, as you're walking on them. There's Otter Cliffs again. You can see it in the distance here. So now I'm moving back up the coast and just giving you a sense of what you can see with the fissures and um, just the really interesting geology. You can even drop down in some of these being, I think, careless. People die in uh, national parks, including Acadia, every year. Um, people have been swept away from this section of um, the, the rocks into the water. So you, you definitely want to be conscious of rogue waves, waves, and know what your tides are doing. 
because the tides on the island are eight to 12 feet. So you wanna make sure that you're aware of all of that. Here again, Boulder Beach, just um, I wanted to share in terms of tides, what that can look like. So here, this is low tide. So you can see the rockweed and the um, barnacles exposed here on these rocks. Again, making it a little bit more treacherous because it's slippery. So that's the other thing when you're walking around on the rocks in Acadia, you wanna be careful because it can be slick. Um, so that would be what a low tide situation might look like. And here it's high tide. So you're way up the beach compared to um, low tide. So again, just the different personalities are what makes it really fun to, you know, visit a national park, of course. So here, um, this is again, looking down at otter cliffs further up, but again, just to share, you can before sunrise do really long exposures. And this isn't even using an ND or anything like that, but um, you can get the water to blur out in ways that can be really pretty and just very serene. And here is this almost the same area once the sun comes up. So it changes so quickly and it can get hot very quickly in terms of light. Um, so you definitely wanna be there before sunrise. And if it is a clear sunny day like this, you don't have much time before you're pretty much feeling like the rock feels um, too hot in terms of light to shoot. So I've spent a lot of time looking down at Otter Cliffs in these. Um, Can't hear you. Can you, is, is everyone fine hearing me, Ann? I can hear you now, Betsy. Okay, so which part did you miss? Um, everything since you switched to this new slide. Okay. So this is um, looking up towards Sand Beach, which is right in here. And so this, I was just saying that all the other um, views, I was looking towards Otter Cliffs, and this is just turning around and looking behind. And so you can get a sense of what some of the topography is like with the different um, mountains here and here. And you can see the exposed areas. Just again, that's what they saw when they first saw Mount Desert that they thought it looked deserted because they have these big patches of granite that are exposed. And the road is right here, just to give you a sense of the Park Loop Road, how close you are to the water. I've actually heard a statistic that the average time people spend out of their car in Acadia is something like six minutes. <laughs> I think since everybody has a camera now with their uh, phone, I, my guess is people get out more because they wanna take Instagram shots and things like that. So again, this is still looking backwards. I left this photographer in here so everyone can see, um, you know, just to give a little sense of scale. One thing um, I mentioned how the rocks change color. The other thing that's really interesting to watch is how water changes color. And so it can be really gem-like um, and really blue if the sky is blue. And so you can really play with these pools of water that capture, get caught in the rocks. Um, and just use those to your advantage when you're trying to compose a photograph. Along with the color of water is also just the um, wave uh, energy. Sometimes you can be out here and there's almost nothing and then you can be here and you can have these bigger waves here. Of course, fog is your friend. I love being in Maine when it's foggy. Um, so the magic of fog is just incredible. The thing that's interesting about Acadia is it can be really foggy in one section of the island and not in another section of the island. Um, so you never really know um, if you're in fog, if you drive to another location, whether that would be in fog too, if it's further away from where you are. So again, fog, and just be super soft, nice, light. You can, you know, hike around and get to different areas so that you're not always shooting the same view of otter cliffs. Um, and then just, you know, trying different skies, different light, if you're getting, you know, sort of feeling like you're doing the same type of shooting. And then if you're sort of feeling done with shooting the big scenes, there's often little things to be looking for 
um, on the rocks. Like you can shoot rock patterns forever. I'm sure Dave does that a lot because I know he loves rocks. So um, looking for things, or even this is across the road from um, the ocean path, which is the actual walkway that goes along the loop road during this, along this really dramatic part of um, the coast. And this, there was a huge tour bus that came and a bunch of people all flooded out. And so I just decided I would like to shoot the opposite side of the road. So this is just right along the road and just really pretty scenes everywhere. And again, if you feel like the crowds are getting too much on that part, you can always try other parts of the coast. You can park along the loop road and hike down and out. This one um, was taken really close to the campground um, where we stayed a couple of years ago with my family. And you can just hike from the campground across the road and out onto this cliff. And I love how little it can make you seem when you're down there and you know the rest of the ocean is, is really big. The other thing you might shoot when you're getting tired of the same scenery is waves. I love playing. Um, I didn't include a whole lot of blurs or anything in this uh, presentation to just wave action over the same section of cliff. Again, you want to, of course, be careful, but to be this close to that kind of energy is really exciting. And there's all, always other smaller rocks. You don't have to be on the edge of the cliff to just look for some really interesting things to photograph. And then, like I mentioned, there's rocks everywhere. So shooting rocks and patterns and the granite is so beautiful um, and so diverse that you can always find rock shots. You will also see, especially on Boulder Beach, a ton of Zen towers, I call them. Um, but it is, it's actually illegal to stack rocks. I love looking at them, but they do consider um, stacking rocks to be like a graffiti, a form of graffiti now. Acadia has some really famous historic cairns, trail cairns, and they're called Bates cairns. And so they want to kind of crack down on this so that people don't destroy those cairns because those cairns were really um, used to wayfind on trails. So. Um, amazing Zen towers, but you're not supposed to do them. Plus, I guess it, it does disrupt habitat in, depending where you are um, as well. But you do see a lot of them, just little spirit towers. And you also see a ton of people, depending when you're there. That's why being photographers, we're lucky in that we're out at times when tourists typically aren't. This is a group that's gathered around Thunder Hole which is a very popular tourist destination. The, boat, uh, the buses all stop there. The cruise ships come into Bar Harbor. They get on the tour bus, Thunder Hole. If you catch it at the right time with the tide, it makes a booming sound that is you can listen for when you're shooting in other places along this coast. And then you'll know like, hey, I should stop by uh, Thunder Hole because the boom just echoes all the way down the coast. It's really, really cool. Um, and then I just wanted to, also mention hiking is phenomenal in Acadia and it's really not that difficult, which um, I like to say like you're really rewarded for a, not a whole lot of effort because the peaks are steep and you're up and above tree line. So if you were like out west or even in like the White Mountains, you're hiking a long time before you're above tree line, but not so with Acadia. So this is a really popular hike. I just wanted to mention it. Uh, if you're just looking for sort of a littler hike to do, and it's called the beehive because it'll let you get up high and look all down this coastline and also look down on sand um, beach. So this is the beehive. You can go up the backside. Um, a couple of years ago when, um, like I said, my family went there, we decided to go up this front side, um, which I'm not a huge fan of heights. So I was nervous, <laughs> but it, um, it's, it's really dramatic because you've got these views the entire time because you're on the exposed rock face. So there you can see, like you see the guy with his red shirt there and this is a close up, so you can see how many people are climbing along there up the beehive trail. And there are parts of it that have rungs, like you can see here. So you really are exposed. Here's a shot of my nephew who is much braver than I was. I'm only taking this picture because there was this tree that you see in the right that was like, I felt like I couldn't fall because the tree was there. But I wanted to share this so you can see Sand Beach and then Schoonerhead is out beyond that. I'm not sure any uh, 
pictures from Schooner Head today, but that's a really nice hike too, is to go park here and walk across the beach. And then there's a nice loop all along Schooner Head. So you can see uh, the beehive has these ledges that the trail goes along, but just the views are phenomenal. And then of course you get to the top and it's well worth the hike. It's only two miles um, round trip, so it's not that bad. And so then you can look all down the coastline and here's Otter Cliffs down here. So just a really fun, like I said, you don't hike that long and you get these incredible views um, all over the island. So just really great hiking. So that's the um, um, sort of dramatic coastline. And next I wanted to um, share Sertamon or Wild Gardens of Acadia. It's famous for its boardwalk that you often can see really pretty pictures of that. But this is for folks who love, you know, gardens and things like this. They have a little museum. I told Jim if he gave me a really nice introduction, I would share this shot that had his a poster they did at Acadia that has his oven bird. So that's Jim's oven bird there that they used for a national park poster. And um, so you can really get oriented to what you're doing and just a phenomenal place to shoot fall. As you um, notice, I have so much fall foliage photographs because it's like endless in terms of the options when you're in Acadia. And if you get an overcast day, like you definitely want to head to sort of all, especially if you have fog. So there are these grasses and trunks and it's just really magical place. Tons of ferns. It's really pretty in the summer too, in terms of the green. Um, but fall just has, of course, its own just brilliant color. I mean, Ohio has great color, but boy, New England, just the fiery reds and the fact that there's the lichen on the trees is so nice on the trunks. So again, some more just the way the grasses are, more color. And like I mentioned, the lichen on the trunks, I think just makes for nice shooting. And then right next to the wild gardens is a place right along the roadside called the Tarn, T-A-R-N. And this is a, just a big marshy area with a steep face on the opposite side. So another really great place to check out, especially if you're just coming out of Sardamont. And um, just the mix of things from berries to pines, the birch. So just really pretty. Um, Acadia is a fun place to shoot foliage because of the ascension of color. So you can be shooting across a field, a meadow, whatever it is, and then you have color rising up behind you because you've got these steep mountains coming out of almost sea level. Uh, the next spot moving around the island, Little Hunter's Beach and Hunter's Stream. This is a little less traveled spot. Little Hunter's Beach um, is right along the loop road and you just take some steps right down. So that gets a lot of folks just stopping by. It's a little cobble beach. It's got beautiful stones. And again, if you're shooting in the blue hour, um, just some really pretty rocks and things like that. Again, you can't collect rocks in Maine. You can see why people would want to, but with millions of visitors, they would all walk away pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but then Little Hunter Stream, um, Hunter Stream rather, is a great trail. It only has about four or five parking spots, but you walk through this just magical forest because it's mossy. If it's foggy, it's even dreamier. Um, the water is, you know, beautiful in terms of just, it's a little bit tannic. And then the um, stones, the moss, like I said, in the creek. So um, you walk along this trail that goes along the creek out to the beach. And so this is the beach. And uh, when the tide is right, it makes a wonderful cobble singing of the rolling of the stones. So you can hear the waves hit and then you hear the as it uh, rolls back out and just uh, really, really pretty. So that was one side of the cove. It's really pretty small. And this is the other side of the cove. Um, and you can see the rocks here are also cobbled like Boulder Beach, um, but a little bit more level for sure. And you, you see the line of um, barnacles at this beach. Again, in lots and lots of rocks and things, there's the barnacles to shoot. 
um, and another just, um, I'm putting these in for you, Dave, of uh, rocks. And of course, even dry, they're pretty interesting, um, even though I love shooting them with water on them um, as well. So the other um, thing I wanted to cover in terms of topics are lakes and ponds. Um, Katie has a number of them. Then I'm just gonna share a little bit from Jordan Pond, Bubble Pond, and Eagle Lake. So this actually is a marsh. This is beaver as you're coming in. But um, I think there's a lot of shoreline along these freshwater. They're just so beautiful to shoot. This is Bubble Pond and such a lovely little pond. You cannot park there anymore. For those of you who've been there, um, you have to take the, Shuttle, which is actually really, I think, important that they have that. L.L. Bean sponsors um, an Explorer, Katie, the Explorer bus, and you can ride for free all over the place. And it's really nice because it reduces the parking pressure and the parking pressure has just gotten phenomenal. I mean, Jordan, the tea house has like multiple extra parking lots and still you cannot get a spot there. So it's really valuable to drive, ride that if you can. I know Photographers, we like having our gear with us, but the parking pressure is just intensifying. Um, so bubble. The other nice thing about the bus is you can um, hike, you know, one way and catch the bus back to your car. So you can do the whole, like, you can go up and over MDI, you know, it's, I think it's like 12 mile hike or something and get, just get the Explorer and get back to your car or into town or wherever you started. So really a uh, nice service. And of course, just like anywhere, the lake shores are so lovely and so many just cool little finds um, around and evening light. This is just super goldy, you know? So again, reflections in the water and then even going closer, a little bit more intimate views of um, looking for a fall color in the water. As well as there's so many marshy areas too. There's a lot you can do with patterns of grasses. And um, I love doing blurs. And so you can do all sorts of uh, motion blurs. And then um, Eagle Lake was the one with the evening light that I shared. Um, and it's right across from Bubble. But this is um, Jordan Pond, perhaps you know, one of the more famous ponds. Almost everybody who goes here uh, to the park goes to Jordan Pond. You can hike around the pond. There's carriage roads, which I'll mention in a second, around the pond. And then these are called the bubbles. Um, but there is a big rock over here called Bubble Rock. Um, so some people say it's not because of what they look like that they're called the bubbles. But um, just a really pretty pond. But it's also really famous because of the tea house, or it's called the Jordan Pond House, which forever has. Um, been a spot where you can sit on the lawn. It's fun just even when they're not open, they have Adirondack chairs out and you can just sit. Um, these are their website photos of, um, it's a modern building, the original one burned down. So you can get lunch and things like that. But what they're famous for is eating popovers, which you see a picture there with strawberry jelly on the lawn. So. It's definitely on the bucket list if you're going to Acadia. And, um, but even off season, I just think it's just a really pretty spot to stop by. And as I mentioned, there are carriage roads around um, Jordan Pond, but there are over 50 miles of carriage roads throughout Acadia National Park, which makes it really unique. And it was a pet project that John D. Rockefeller designed, financed it, and put in all these trails and these 17 bridges, which are all like on the historic record, they're considered the you know, best example of these broken stone roads and bridges in the US. And they, you're not allowed to be on them in cars. So um, they're great for biking, walking, hiking. There is a stable you can rent, uh, go for a ride on, uh, in a carriage on the carriage trails. There's um, a covered bridge right there that's very famous because it's a cobblestone bridge. So you can see that it's cobbles on the outside, but what's really beautiful is the inside is all lined with cobbles 
as well as you can see underneath the arch there. Here's a further away view of the cobblestone. And just one other carriage road. So they just snake their way all through the park. Like I said, I, I've always wanted to go up and cross country ski some winter along the carriage roads. All right, so that um, sort of covers a few things working our, our way around the loud side. So now this is making our way over to the quiet side or the other side of this Somme Sound, which is actually a fjord, which is interesting geologically that um, I think it might be the only fjord on the East Coast, or maybe it's just the biggest one. So um, as you're driving, I just wanted to share a few like roadside shots because you could spend forever just <laughs> pulling off and shooting because there's so many pretty things. Lupin, of course, is a uh, exotic and invasive, but it sure is pretty. And it's all over coastal Maine. Again, as I was mentioning how you can see color and trees ascending up the mountain sides, color everywhere in the fall. Big vistas across the water. More birch trees. There are actually aspens as well that are really pretty in fall. This is near Seal Harbor, the town uh, where Martha Stewart has a huge estate. But I've heard that um, hers is not as big as Dick Wolf, the guy who started Law and Order. Um, that whole franchise, he has a huge um, estate in Seal Harbor as well. The interesting thing is when you drive through Seal Harbor, it's a teeny little town and you don't see any of these. And you really only see these huge mansions when you're actually on the ocean looking back. So as you're driving around um, into the quiet side, there's a really nice little trail called, well, there's two of them. They're right next to each other, Wonderland and Ships Harbor. And they're very popular with families because it's so flat. So as you can see up here, the coastline, once you get over on the other side, really levels out. Look how flat it is compared to what we were looking at over by Otter Cliffs. So the geology is really different and um, it's really good for tide pools. So um, it's a nice one mile loop hike. And if you're there at the right time with the tide, um, it's fun to check out what you might see in the tide pools. And of course, um, then the sort of photographer's destination and a lot of tourist destination. Um, the big thing <laughs> because I find it difficult to shoot, as you can see from my processing. I'm not very good at the um, getting buildings level and also keeping the coast line level. So those of you who are really good at that, though, wouldn't have any trouble with this, I'm sure. But the weather is right and the sunset is right because you can shoot it with the sun, you know, sinking in that frame. If you use something like Photographer's Ephemeris, you can time which day you should be there to catch that. Um, there's just a lot of people, and this is a very narrow, you, you come down very steep steps, and this is just a very, very narrow stretch. Like you can see that most of the shot here is low tide, where it's all dark with the rockweed, the seaweed. That would all be underwater at high tide. So it's a very narrow band, and um, people, you know, want to be where they want to be. So definitely worth, though, just you're not up for the challenge of jockeying your tripod in a spot it's it's still just for whatever reason um are always attractive and they're always different so i just uh, that are at this lighthouse are really good to work um i know ed torek who's a member of the society has a really nice one with a reflection of the lighthouse in the pool and also as you're hiking down there's other areas that you can shoot of rocks so you can see here on the um, photo on the right where you can catch cool reflections in the rock. And then once you leave the uh, lighthouse and you work your way over to Bernard, which is a little town, and it's really nice to time it for sunset later in the day because you get this gorgeous light that you can see here. Late light hits all the boats and the boats are back. So if you're there um, earlier, 
and it's a fishing day, then you know the fishing boats obviously won't be in the harbor, but the light is really nice in the evening. And so it's just this little town with uh, a lot of fishing. You can see all the traps here on the piers, um, things to shoot like buoys and stuff that's classic Maine. So this is the view from um, a lobster pound called Thurston's, which is um, a place to put on your bucket list if you're gonna be over on the quiet side for sure. This is the view from their dining looking across at this fishing pier. And up from the pier, this building that's pretty famous because of all of the buoys that they have on there. And of course, each fisher person, fisherman has their own pattern of buoy. So it's funny when people collect buoys and put them like in their yard as decoration where it's like people know whose those are and you could return them, you know? So, um, but this is fun to shoot. They've changed it now with the new railing and stuff. So it's, it's not quite, quite as cool looking, but still neat. And of course, as I mentioned, there is a lobster pound there called Thurston's. And for those of you who like lobster, um, this is definitely a place you want to try. And you get the shore dinner, which has, you know, corn on the cob, blueberry cake. Um, so, and the, this is sitting right on the harbor. So like looking out at the boats and the pier and everything. So it's super fun. Another view of the harbor that you see when you're on um, Thurston's deck. And Thurston's reminds me that I could talk a long time <laughs> about food, like Jim said it. One of the things that's so fun about Acadia is like, you can have this national park experience, as I mentioned, and still go into town and the food is phenomenal. So you really can like make your rounds by what you want to eat. And so Two Cats is probably one of the best breakfast places ever. Um, Trenton Bridge Lobster Pound is another super classic pound. It's right before you go over the bridge to um, Mount Desert Island. And so you can see the steaming pots there uh, where they're actually boiling the lobster. Uh, Cafe This Way is another just really great. Um, oops, trying to admit someone from the waiting room there. Another really great restaurant. And of course, when you're um, making your food bucket list, you want to include not just lobster, but whoopie pies are on there. Lobster rolls is a they're delicious and also just an easier way to eat lobster. Um, and then, of course, um, there are a lot of great places on MDI to get ice cream. And so um, blueberry ice cream is another thing that you might want to put on your food bucket list when you head out there. All right. So the last specific stop in Acadia I wanted to talk about is Cadillac. As I mentioned, it's the highest um, peak on the East Coast. It is the first place in the United States that you see the sunrise. So it's a really popular place on uh, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve for people to watch the sun come up on New Year's Day. Um, and it's um, 1530, so 1530 feet high. But as you can see, once you get up there, you get a lot of views. It feels like you're a lot higher than that. So this is Great Meadow and this is like how the mountains um, rise up so steeply like Cadillac. So here's some um, people on the top of the coast right here. So again, these big balds. Again, you'll see a lot of people, of course, hiking around, taking in the sites. They do have these paved trails now to keep people from just um, rock hopping around. But you will see people. Um, it's not unallowed, but you definitely want to be careful with that in terms of impact. But what's so cool is this island fog that you'll see when the temperatures are changing and the islands will just be cloaked with these little shawls of fog that are just really dreamy. And you can see the little, uh, you know, pointy, some people, I think it's a book called Land of the Pointy Fur, referring to uh, Maine. 
this is my nephew and my um, brother-in-law up at Cadillac. One thing that it's really known for is wind. So that they're just standing there letting the wind blow their jackets. So you definitely want to bundle up or have stuff ready because it can be a lot colder up there and very windy. I've um, damaged my tripod head from it being blown over actually. So although a lot of people think about Cadillac is a morning spot. I think it's a really pretty evening shoot because the light gets so golden, as you can see here. Um, and this is again, looking out towards over Bar Harbor, towards other peninsulas. And here's um, a little wind jammer. If you get tired of shooting, there's so many things you can do to other islands rock climbing, mountain biking, there's lots and lots of things you can do. And again, here's um, not looking over the ocean, but looking out towards the lakes and the way and back to the mainland. And so just a, a shot of how fog can just layer in um, in the distance up there. Another view looking out, this is and uh, we were really fortunate on the road trip that we were up there one evening and fog was rolling across just below us because this is one of the real magical things in Acadia is to, your, to go up Cadillac and be able to look down on the fog banks. So you can be up there and see no ocean because it's all fogged in. So really, really special time to be up there. And of course, you could shoot fall up there forever. These low bush blueberries just flame so red. It's like surreal to see. Um, and it, there's kind of steep, but you can definitely find different compositions and still stay on the rock without damaging things. But here's a person over here just to give you a sense of scale. And here again, this is um, on Cadillac, but looking down on the rest of the island, just all socked in with fog. Looking across at different islands and ocean. And again, the Bar Harbor with the islands out beyond. So the last thing, since I've shared some places, I wanted to talk about more generally is this thing I call like main mojo or main magic, um, which is what really makes Maine such a special place um, to visit. So you may know that there are a number of visual as well as uh, artists as well as writers who called Maine home. And this is just a sampling of them. So it is a great place to go and do art because it's you're kind of steeped in this history of artists who've made work there and made their home there as well. So when you're trying to think, what is this main magic? It's like, oh, maybe it's because you can actually get lobster rolls at McDonald's, <laughs> but no. Uh, I think it's something less tangible than lobster rolls at McDonald's. But I wanted to share an example when um, Jim and Ed and I were on Cadillac one evening, we we're driving up thinking, oh, maybe we could catch like something with the sunset. We were done for the day and we were happening to be near the road and we thought, oh, let's just go up. Well, it looked like it was just socking in clouds, no no opportunity to shoot anything, except we saw this little slit and thought, oh, maybe there'll be a sunset. We should just pull right over and there's a little pull out. And so we got out and set up our tripod stuff. And just as we did that, the sun dropped into that little slit and it just illuminated the fog that was around us. And these are not great photographs. I just wanted to share them to give you just a little sense of like the color that just began to glow like we should have just put our stuff away and just enjoyed this like sunset fog it just felt like it was swirling in this like uh reds and purples and orange and it was super magical 
And then poof, it just was gone. You know, as soon as the sun like dropped down out of the slit. So it just enveloped us and then disappeared. And I was like, that's what main magic is about. Like these moments like that, where you sort of have these experiences that make you feel um, part of something bigger and yet make you feel small at the same time. I think some of you probably know what I mean by that. So um, I used to think that maybe part of what was so magical were these big scenes, you know, these postcard vistas and things like this coast is so dramatic that I've spent there, the more I realize, like, I like the quiet stuff. You know, or like, and little scenes, just little things that you, you know, are driving by or you're hiking by and it just feels like a special place. Uh, this is, just as you come on to the island. So like I said, it's the first place that you see sunrise. Jim took this on the road trip. Um, and so I used to think, ah, oh, maybe it's the magic of sunrise being the, the first place that you see sunrise. But also the sunsets are pretty special too. And so this is up on Cadillac and you can see the sun reflecting in a little island in the distance um, with the water just I found a quote because what would a presentation be without a quote this is a quote that I really do like about Acadia and it says standing on this great whaleback of granite with this wide coastal world at your feet you can see the roundness of the earth in your mind's eye and sense keenly the orderliness of the solar system. So that's a little of uh, the magic that I feel in Acadia and in Maine, and um, hopefully it sparks your desire to go there or to return there, since I know many of you have been there before. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions, and I'd love it if. Folks who've been there would like to share any insights they have about Acadia as well. I think we're all muted though. So Anne, can you unmute people? I think I can let everybody unmute if they would like or to. Or maybe people can unmute themselves. I think so. Everybody should be able to unmute themselves if they would like to. I'm in Boston and, and I, I just purchased an RV, which I should be getting this week or next week. And we're gonna go visit him in, in Framingham. And Acadia was next on the list. And I, I crossed it off because I was gonna go from Framingham back to uh, Denver to see my, my grandchildren. But now I think we're gonna do a little detour again. <laughs> I, well, I've, did, I've done some, I've been to, to LLB and I've seen a little bit of the park but not much. I said, well, you know, we'll do it again another time, but maybe my plans just changed. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, that's so exciting. We'll take route one on your way up there and you can shoot some other things too, but yeah, I I'm, hope I'm, you end up going. I will a, say- I'm pulling your camper now. Route one might be questionable up there. I don't know. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. Um, one thing um, I don't think I mentioned is that you know, Cadillac, now you have to make a reservation to ah, go up okay. to Cadillac. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I don't know. They started that in the pandemic as because it's so it can be really crowded up there and they're continuing it. So I don't know if this is now just going to be forever and ever. Um, but so if you do know your dates, you'd want to look and see like when you can make a reservation if you'd like to go up dates, there. Dates are flexible. Yeah, there you go. Huh? 
Well, that's exciting. How great to be able to travel again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. One of my memories was the dawn chorus of birds in June. Uh, so I was just wondering what, what you would tell people about the critters and does Otter Cliff have a history of otters? Yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure because nobody's seen them there, but I think people thought they saw them. That's the story I heard. I don't know if Dave, if you've heard a different story. I think people thought they were there or something, but they were really minks or I don't know. Jim, do you remember? No, I, your, I don't know it. Oh, I saw your um, mic light up. So I thought maybe you're going to say something. Maybe they yeah, saw I don't really know, but yeah, the birds are, oh, what's that, Dave? Maybe they saw seal heads and thought they were otters out in the water or something. Yeah, maybe. Um, but the birding is, yeah, phenomenal, as you know. And there is, it's like something I'd like to do someday, is there is that Acadia Birding Festival um, that's supposed to be really fun. And Scudic, there's an education center over on Scudic, and they actually also have been having birding weeks and birding weekends. This is before COVID um, as a way of you know, taking you to some of the better spots, the bird on the island. If, if you're interested in the, the Acadia Birding Festival, uh, one of our members, Joe Blanda, has spoken at it uh, on, on one occasion. And I don't know what the invitation, I'm sure the invitation this year is, there isn't one, but uh, um, he has spoken there before, so. Betsy, one of the things that I love about the Maine coast is you can keep going back and to the same spot over and over again. And every time you go, it's different because the tide is different and the clouds are different and the sun is different and, and you just see different things. And uh, I think your presentation really uh, highlighted that. And that's, that's, that's really one of the nice things about that coast to me. Yeah, that's a really good point. Always changing. Yeah. I guess if there's no other questions. Well, I don't, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say, I thought this was a really good presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um, just a lot of the pictures made me really smile. Ah, Thank thanks, Lori. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, we were going to do a fall road trip this year, you know, to because I know Lori was on the last one um, and we had so much fun on that trip in terms of it, we had just great opportunities for shooting too with fog and the skies were great. Um, but with everything with um, the pandemic, but then also it's just really hard to do lodging because so many of the places had to honor lodging that was canceled last fall. So, but we're hoping to do it in the future. All right. Well, thank you very much, Betsy. Yeah, well, thank yeah. you all. Thank you so much for making the time to be here tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Betsy. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon. Wouldn't miss Good it. Night. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Betsy. Good everybody. Good night. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you.